We have a real treat uh, this evening, and thanks everyone for coming. I am uh, so happy uh, my good friend Roshi Michelle Engu No Can Do Dobbs is joining us. Uh, Engu is the abbot of Ocean Zendo in, uh, on Long Island. Um, and uh, though born in Paris, Michelle is a dyed in the wool New Yorker. And, uh, and Michelle, I'm making this up completely, so you'll just have to roll with it. He, he boiled down and summarized Dogen Zenji for me in one word. It was, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't, I can't, I, I, you know, I, I'll never forget that. <laughs> so, um, uh, Engu uh, was the first successor of, I believe, first successor of uh, Peter Murray O. Matheson, who was the first successor of Bernie Glassman, who was the first successor of Maizumi Roshi. So, uh, you know, we've been doing, uh, Michelle, I'm not sure I've told you, but we've been doing a series on lineage all spring since January. And, 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 and yours is interesting in that regard, uh, the, the way that that flows. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> you know, I could do an introduction for forty-five minutes, and then you could talk. You're, for... you're good. I'm I'm loving it. And we... <laughs> uh, you, you and then you could talk for five, and then uh, uh, right. we, uh, Ingo is my my good Dharma brother, and I and, and one of the at Zen Peacemakers, I'm really blessed to have so many teachers and. Uh, Ango is one of them, and uh, a very unique one at that. Uh, at the Native American Plunge last year, we shared we shared a room, and uh, one of us snores, and I'm not saying which is which. <laughs> but there are re but there are recordings. That's what a <laughs> iPhones are good for that. So, well, no videos, no videos, though. no videos. So. Uh, without any more goofing off, because by golly, we're here to be serious tonight. Uh, I'm going to pass the talking step over to my good friend uh, No Can Do, and uh, and let you let you do like you can do. This was given to me by Bernie. If you can believe it. So the other interesting thing is that I'm also Bernie's last transmission in as uh, that he gave me transmission as a Roshi. He gave me um, Inca. And so it's kind of strange that, um, yeah, it's like a circle. I can't even forget. I, I get lost without a map, but um, it, it's a. That's that's an interesting thing. I've I've tried to see if anyone else has ever had that, where their teacher transmitted to them, and then their teacher's teacher transmitted to them. You know, it's it's uh, it's something, but not worth thinking about actually. <laughs> Only when you're like stuck in traffic or something. <laughs> forget um, about it. <laughs> forget about it. So. Thank you for the introduction, and yeah, I, um, is everybody actually from Colorado in this group? Linda, I know you. Yeah, Colorado, a bunch of Coloradans. I'll be with you tomorrow. I'm coming up to, to marry my daughter on Friday. <laughs> so, um, that's another, that's another story, and we'll leave it at that, but... She lives in Windsor, so we're flying in tomorrow and uh, we'll do the ceremony. We picked the hottest day on the calendar, so um, yeah, Friday we'll we'll be up in I think around Estes Park, and and um, <laughs> you'll read about us on Saturday. <laughs> so Jeff asked me to talk to you a little bit about the order of disorder. And I really don't know that much about it, honestly. It's a it's a covert operation. Um, when I was pulled into it, uh, kidnapped, it was like more like Shanghai. I was Shanghai into it um, uh, when we did a trip in around 2004, 2005 to Japan, 
uh, a bunch of folks and we went and we retraced the the trip that Bernie and Murillo, uh, Peter Matheson had done and that and that Peter had written about in Nine Headed Dragon River. Um, and so we went to all these temples and it was really uh, beautiful. We met, met teachers and and uh, a wonderful trip. I would sit in the back of the bus in between temples and just be a wise guy. <laughs> and and then Bernie said to me, you know what? Um, I want you to uh, become the coordinator of the order of disorder. And so I, I have a habit of saying yes um, before I know what I'm getting into. Um, and so I did. And then he said, contact this guy, Peter Cuckoo Cunningham, who did all the photographs when they, when they traveled uh, uh, to Japan. He, t he took a lot of pictures and he, he has, if you don't know his work, he's got beautiful work that is about Zen peacemakers. He spent a lot of time with Bernie and um, on street retreat in various places. Cuckoo is uh, is quite a guy, and he. So I contacted him and I said, "Well, do you have a list of members?" And he said, "Well, there is a list, <laughs> but I, I can't find it." <laughs> That's how it started. <laughs> We're still looking for the list, and actually, we we decided at some point that everybody was a member of the Order of Disorder, whether they believed it or not. Um, you know. And um, <laughs> and and somewhere on one of our websites, there's a place click here to join, and that's what it tells you when you click here. It says you're already a member, you know. <laughs> and what we do a lot of the times is is whenever anyone asks to join, we make them president uh, automatically. So if you're interested in being the president of the Order of Disorder, just ask me later <laughs> about how to join. Yeah. But Bernie did that as a way of, he saw that, um, that uh, you know, Zendo's and Zen in, was getting like this very serious kind of tone to it. Uh, people were really taking it very seriously. And, uh, and he thought that that in some ways was, um, you know, contrary to, to the, the, the freedom and and spontaneity and and joy that uh, you know um, is also part of our life and can be a part of Zen. And it's funny because he was he was doing all these things, and then like I remember independently of that, I I was noticing that Kin Hin was maybe one of the most um, depressing looking things. <laughs> with everyone walking around with their eyes downcast slowly, you know. And so I started wearing a clown nose when we would do kinhin just to see if anyone was actually paying attention. <laughs> or if they were like so into the form that they like completely lost the spirit. So, uh, and then, you know, then all of a sudden Bernie was wearing a clown nose. And, and so I don't, I, I'm sure he did before I did, but, but, uh, but it was funny that we did a lot of we, we did kind of in parallel kind of things. Um, but uh, you know, so so I think that that he 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 was interested in kind of finding a way of of um, of playing with our per you know like life is 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 what it is it's happy sometimes it's not always happy you know we've we've certainly all experienced a couple of years of of you know um uh, you know tremendous loss and grief out here on the east coast it's like you know people were dropping and you'd go into work and everyone wearing a mask and had to be six feet apart and like plexiglass everywhere and and all of a sudden we were meeting on computers instead of in person and uh so you know uh one of the things that i my my daughter the one who's getting married actually she was the one who got me a mask that looks like this and i started wearing it to work every day you know <laughs> and 
and uh, I work with about I work in a big cookie factory Tate's um, and I, I've been there for a long time so I know many of the people there and there's about 500 people that work there mostly Latin Latino Latina um, and um, and so I would go I go around every day and say hi to everybody you know all through COVID I'm going around and saying hello how are you what's happening you know como esta tu familia etc and and you know um, it was funny because sometimes I wouldn't wear the clown mask and they would get really upset with me you know <laughs> they'd, they'd say payaso Michel donde esta tu mascara you know so I I wear a clown mask at work all the time now. We still we we still are doing it. Who like we we had about a, a week and a half of no more masks, and then and then we got the new you know uh, whatever it is. Uh, so uh, we're back to doing it, but hopefully it'll be sort of done soon. I don't know, but um, so one of the things is you know we connect deeply in 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 joy you know there's a deep sense of connection when we can laugh together um it, it also is true in grief um you know and in our suffering we can connect deeply but it's a lot more fun if you want to <laughs> if you want to try you could try an exercise and do like a little connecting in grief and then a little connecting in joy joy is like uh you know it, it's heads and tails more fun than than grief not that grief isn't you know of course part of our our experience but um but even then you know i find when my when my 10 years ago when my dad was dying uh he he uh, had decided to stop eating. He had uh, lung cancer, and uh, after about four or five days of not eating, which is really painful, especially for the first four or five days, one of the nurses came in and said, "You know, you can take ice chips. It'll relieve some of that thirst without really altering what you're doing." And so he started taking ice chips, and he was like. <laughs> He was he became an ice chip junkie <laughs> he was like and so one night he had had a tracheotomy and he says to me i guess i'm cheating and i go uh i don't think you you can fail at this like the <laughs> you know like and we both laughed really hard you know we, we had a really good laugh you know so even in in the grief that joy is still a possibility you know um, and, a, and a way of um, you know you, you have to be careful like one of the things that I've learned is you, you you also you know if I go around and someone's really grieving or or has you know I, I don't obviously you know clown with them you know but um, I but I also you know am wearing a clown mask but <laughs> But, but I also, you know, am open to the possibility. A every moment is completely open, right? And so, this practice, the order of disorder, is a way of, of reminding us of that, of being really, really free. You know, not stuck in one or the other. It is a tricky thing because I've seen some people get so excited about the connection and the joy that they kind of use it like, like, uh, you know, there's that expression like. Uh, just because you know the hammer drives a nail really well doesn't mean it's a good screwdriver like you need a few tools in your toolbox and so um, you know of course uh, you know when when compassion and and uh, and love in any of its many forms is is needed that's what you, you need to be alert and attentive to that fact and I some of the clowning workshops that I've done with Mr. Yuhu, uh, who's one of, the, who was Bernie's clown teacher, he's all about creating a space and inviting people into it, you know, not dragging people into it and forcing them, you know, but inviting them into it, right? So um, I'm a New Yorker. It's a little hard 
because we're a little more aggressive than <laughs> like sometimes we pull a little but um it, it is I, I did a a thing recently about you know it was all about will smith remember when when the slap you know and so you know the, the whole idea of crossing that line right when do you cross the line you know um and it was kind of interesting to look at that with a group and see all different people's uh reactions responses you know feelings about it um so yeah yeah there's one koan that i usually love to use uh to talk about the order of disorder and it's it's uh ling chow ling chow was layman pang's daughter and uh she was a one she was you know the 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 pang family i don't know if any of you know them there they were uh uh eighth century uh chinese uh, layman pang was this wonderful very free teacher uh student dharma dharma guy who you know studied with uh shitao and matsu and so he was really and it's wonderful because his big question was that he asked um sh so shitao and matsu at the time were like the two great zen teachers the lineage of soto zen comes from shitao sekito and matsu was the um uh, Rinzai tradition their lineage comes from him and both of them were these incredible uh, teachers at a time in China when you know uh, I think something like uh, it was like 60 percent of the population in in something like 10 or 15 years died uh, from war uh, famine disease like it was really bad times in China and these two teachers sprung up at this time you know there was like this tremendous hunger for being awake right and Layman Pang went to study with both of these teachers and his big question to them was what about someone who has no connection with the 10,000 dharmas right what about someone who has no connection to the world to the universe you know and uh Shitao did this wonderful thing where he held his hand over Pang's mouth so he couldn't say anything else. <laughs> and and uh and and Layman Pang didn't quite get it and so Shitao uh, said maybe you should go study with Matsu. And uh he did and Matsu said I'll answer when you swallow the Yangtze River in one gulp you know so uh, so that was the but I love that question you know what about when when a person has no connection with the universe you know what a wonderful question and if you look at Layman Pang he was like this incredible he really had a great sense of humor like if you want to read the record of Layman Pang, it's one of the best, um, funniest uh, Dharma books. <laughs> there, which there's not a ton of really funny ones, but that one's pretty good. So um, his whole family practiced, and Ling Chao, his daughter, was considered to actually be the 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 the, the brightest of them all, the, the the most clear. And one day. The layman was crossing over a bridge carrying basket all these baskets because he had been selling baskets that's how he made a living and um and he fell and the baskets rolled all over the place and he was like lying on the street and ling chow saw this and she ran up and she threw herself down on the ground right next to him <laughs> and layman pang said what are you doing and she said, well, I saw you fall, so I'm helping. And he said, it's a good thing nobody's looking. <laughs>
Now, what I love about that story is I, I really do love that story. It's such a wonderful expression, right, of bearing witness um, of, of the work that we do, you know. Um, I think so often what I see is that we, we have solutions before we even listen to find out what's really going on with somebody, you know. And, and um, recently I've been listening a lot to uh, Father uh, Greg Boyle, who's going to be giving a talk soon, next week or in 10 days or something. Um, uh, oh, the, the, he's the priest who uh, started Homeboy Industries, which is the biggest, largest gang intervention program in the world, supposedly. And uh, he's, he's really... Uh, a, 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 you know, a, a great guy, great teacher, uh, and and one of the things that he talks about is that at Homeboy, their work is really just to be together, you know, just to spend time together. That's where healing happens. It it's not like anyone's fixing anybody else or off, you know. Help a you know help is is asked for, help is given, but it's not about fixing people, you know. It's about being with them and living with them together. Like, and I think that that's a really beautiful model um, for us. And it's what Ling Chao is doing when she throws herself down on the ground next to her father. You know, it's not like she went and picked up all the baskets. It's like, now I know what you went through. <laughs> um, but it, what I like also about it is the symbolism of falling down together. You know, um, in uh, in the Micmac, uh, which is uh, a, a local to New York, New York, New England, Northeast uh, n indigenous uh, group, the Micmac have a saying. It's Maui Dajik, and it means things fall together. And what that means is like just trusting and and watching how things fall together and work out the way that they're supposed to you know without you necessarily having to fix it all or or carry it all um things fall together yeah yeah um so uh I think that one of the, the, the things that I've been really looking at recently has been, you know, th there's so much of the suffering that I see has to do with um, people not feeling connected, people not feeling, um, like, on top of all the difficult things that, that um, happen in life, I know w when it happens to me, you know, like when, when something really sad happens to me and I feel like no one, no one knows what this is like. This is really hard, you know, <laughs> and, and then I feel very alone, you know, and, and that aloneness is actually the hardest thing. Um, and I'll give you an example, a true example. So, so both my mother, my mother is 89 and, and I'm her caregiver, uh, principal caregiver. And my, my brother, my older brother, he's 60. He has Down syndrome. And he, uh, both of them are suffering from dementia. Um, so if you really wanna have like a mind bending car ride, <laughs> you should come and spend a day when when we drive around together they like are talking to each other and they're like talking about something totally different than each other and they and some days i can really you know find the joy and humor and love in it and some last weekend i spent the day with them and it, and it was really really hard um it's just really hard to to a lot of it was the projection of how does this story end you know like um uh th there's a lot of suffering to come in this story for me <laughs> and for us you know um and so uh 
when I came back from from that day, um, I just was feeling like so, you know, sad, and and I just kind of for probably a day, I just kind of couldn't couldn't get past it, you know, and then uh, Monday, the, the the following Monday that. That was a Saturday. The Sunday, I kind of just lay around, and and on the Monday, when I went into work and I'm walking around saying hello to everybody, and you know, three people told me like within 15 minutes, you know, just these really difficult things that they were going through. Um, not that I was asking, you know, but they they just said, "Oh, Michelle, I'm having such a hard time," you know, one of one a, a young woman had lost her recently lost a, a, a pregnancy you know um, uh, another woman was just feeling really depressed uh, because her relationship wasn't going well another woman was getting and and it was like wow <laughs> you know um, it um, that f that realization of connection of of oh I'm not suffering alone you know um, it opened my heart a little bit you know uh, back up and and so that uh, so that I could keep opening my heart up you know um, one of the ways that I like to express the three tenets is, is uh, I, I like to say empty mind open heart be kind um, that's the way that I teach it when I, I used to before COVID I, I used to go and spend uh, a night every week with uh, young men who were in jail <clears throat> and that was the way that I taught it to them it, to them is like you know keep your mind empty of all your opinions ideas keep your heart open and just be kind you know um, so having opening you know opening your heart is is a good way to connection and um, I think that this this that feeling of, of um, isolation that feeling of uh, separation is w w one of the main causes of, of suffering and even lar larger scale it's it's the cause of our environmental crisis it's the cause of our, you know, war in in the Ukraine or wherever wars are being fought. It's the cause of uh, racism and 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 uh, white supremacy. These these shootings is this sense of like separation, not seeing the oneness, not seeing the 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 connection of life, you know. So, one of the, the you know, the, the, there are lots of practices that we do for the order of disorder. We have specific practices, and I'm going to encourage you to do them. Um, <laughs> just fooling. <laughs> no. <laughs> one of the... One of the ones that, that Bernie had that's really beautiful is like, you know, when you get up in the morning, look at yourself in the, in the mirror and laugh. Uh, and I always thought that was a really wonderful practice, you know. And it's, it's funny because um, it is a practice, you know. It really is a practice to encounter life with joy. It's, it, it's, it's natural, I think. But uh, along with the, the many ways that we s carry this story of separation, we also have forgotten how to, to open up and be joyful, you know. In, in, and, and even to the point where, you know, if you tell someone, if you talk to someone about joy, they kind of dismiss it like that's not very serious, you know. <laughs> and it's like, no, this is really serious. It's actually the most serious thing is how can you enjoy your life like otherwise what's the point you know you could bust out all the spreadsheets you want and 
you know, um, do, write papers and do analysis and get a book. And but it's here in your heart. It's it's always here in your heart. You know, you don't have to really, you know, use props. I mean, props are good. This is probably one of the best props. Someone gave it to me at work. I call it um, the Order of Disorder Rakasu. And I think you guys should all run out and get one. Very nice. And you can wear it on top of your Rakasu, which is pretty cool. Or you can wear it as a bow, which is like, you know, pretty nice. So, but finding ways, right, of, of, of laughing, finding ways, you know, it's so funny um, when when I was coming back recently, we did a we were we, we were doing a planning trip out to South Dakota, and I was it was like the first time I'd been in an airport for a long time. Nice feather. <laughs> and we were I was I was in the airport, and I had my clown mask on, and I was sitting and watching this family. There was an older woman who came, and she was having a little bit of a hard time with her bag, so I helped her. And she sat kind of across from me and, you know, when you go to help an older woman in a clown mask, <laughs> you risk airport security, but that, regardless, I risked it. And, and um, all of a sudden, this, this family, it was her family, they, they came and it was her granddaughter and her great granddaughter. And this little girl, she's looking at me and she's looking at me like, you know, and all of a sudden she starts going, dad, dad. <laughs> and, and the dad is on his phone or something. He's like not paying much attention as, as adults do to children. And she's like, dad, dad, there's a clown behind you. There's a clown behind you. <laughs> and the dad never saw me. He never saw me, you know, and and it made me think that's uh, like I came. I was like, there's clowns all around us, you know, but we're like so shuttered into like, you know, like, oh, here I go. You know, I'm on my phone and and we miss it. You know, we miss it. We miss these clowns all around us. So. um you don't all have to run out and buy clown masks, but finding ways to connect like that, you know, um, uh, and it, it, it's, it's, I think it's really important, you know, um, I really do think it's important. It's like, and, and, and then I was standing on this line and boy, this, this one woman started berating like the flight attendant, you know, uh, or the, the woman at the check-in counter. She was like letting her have it about something. And it was ugly, you know. And she was just so calm and steady and the flight, the, 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 the check-in lady. And when they were done and the interaction had, you know, happened and, and like everyone kind of had disappeared, I was on a later flight and I walked up to her and I said, you know, I just want to tell you, I so admire the way that you handled that. You were really calm. You didn't buy into it. You didn't get angry. You didn't. And it was just really wonderful to watch. And she's looking at me. Here I am <laughs> telling her all this in my clown mask. <laughs> and and she was she it was just such a sweet thing, you know, and she was like, oh, my God, I love your mask, you know. So, um Finding ways to connect, uh, and and humor is a wonderful way to connect. When we go out west and spend time with the Lakotas, they tell us like we have. They laugh a lot, you know. And I mean, it's incredible how much they laugh. And they are, you know, deeply hurt people. Like a, a lot of the times, you know, they've they've endured like, you know, uh, of any group of people, they've endured like, you know pretty much 300 years of of like the largest most powerful country in the world trying to kill them you know um and and yet they laugh they laugh a lot a lot you know and and when we're together we, we, you know i laugh a lot we laugh a lot together 
And it's such a beautiful thing. And they, they say it's healing to laugh together. And if we didn't do it, we wouldn't be here anymore. You know, um, if we didn't have a way, uh, it's just a way to deal with some of these really hard things that we have to deal with. Um, and that's not to say, like, you know, obviously, they, they, they sometimes they need help other than somebody coming in in clown shoes. But, but you know, um, to keep that sense of connection, to keep that sense of joy, you know, uh, about life, it is so important. Um, it's so, so important. So, um, let's see. I think I'm going to open it up and let you guys ask me questions now. Cause I, th I think that's good, Angu. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, just very quickly, however, uh, since you mentioned Yuhu, we'll just share a quick picture of Yuhu. There's Yuhu. <laughs> there he is. Look how, you know, I got to work with him, too. That doesn't look that happy. <laughs> the weight of the world yeah you who is a, a wonderful i think he's been uh, he recently was with miko up in finland and they were at an amusement park and they sent me pictures of the um i'm wondering if i can do this on the here let's see if i can do this they sent me some very interesting bathroom signs okay let's see no you can't see it not so well no so it's it's a guy standing with a clown nose on though and, <laughs> and then there's a woman doing it and and a baby anyway yeah so they were they were clowning around up in finland it's universal apparently apparently <laughs> if anybody has a question or a comment for for Ingu, uh, please let's relax and even if God forbid, even if it's silly <laughs> or serious or serious. Yeah, I do serious. Not much. Something must have occurred. I have a question. Scott, please. Thanks. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Great. Yeah, I was curious because my uh, grandfather and my father, you know, they grew up in uh, Rockville Center, Long Island. Yeah. And when you were saying at the beginning is everyone, you know, from Colorado and uh, Sean had mentioned your your center is on Long Island somewhere. Where Where is that exactly? So I'm pretty, my my wife is from close, she's from Malvern, my wife. Up oh, in yeah. County, so yeah. close to Rockville Center. I live out in Sag Harbor. Okay. And our Zendo is in Bridgehampton. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. So, like, um, we're in the fancy part of <laughs> Suffolk County. The fancy part of Suffolk County, the Hamptons. Oh, yeah. Good. Well, my brother's still there. I might suggest he get out there or something. Yeah, yeah. Let him know. It's, a, it's, it's beautiful out here. Um, I'm... I spent a lot of time up in the city because my mom is still there. So uh, mm -hmm. when I'm not working, I spend weekends up in the city. Well, so. Thank you. I really enjoy your talk today. Thanks, Thanks Scott. Scott. Thanks, Scott. Anyone else? Anything spare? Oh, um, Yoshin, hi. Oh, Anyway, thank you for your talk, uh, Roshi. Um, I have a, a question. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you include clowning around uh, in the Sangha setting? <laughs> um, I'd love to really, you know, hear about some of that. I think that, you know, um, I, I was really, I was, um, you know, pondering or, 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 you know, the seriousness of Zen. And, you know, when I, whenever I, look at what's going on and you know some some well-known songas around the country or i listen to podcasts and i pay attention to materials from other other songas you know i think wow they're so serious they're so hardcore you know <laughs> and 
And one of the, one thing I always feel about our song is that we're yeah, <laughs> we're I, I do think we are a little more laid back and more relaxed, which which is really comforting in many ways. But I, I really would love to hear how you include the clowning around in the sangha setting and in, in for your for your Zen center. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. So it took me a long time to be comfortable with the role. Well, not so much with the role of a clown. I've been a <laughs> I've been a clown all my life, but but when I was like a reluctant, um, you know, priest, a reluctant <laughs> uh, Dharma teacher, reluctant like authority, you know, yikes. Uh, so it took a while to be comfortable enough with that to you know uh, clown around. I don't do. I'm not, uh, I laugh, I love to laugh, I laugh a lot, you know, um, I, 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 I'm told I've got a sense of humor, it might be a bad one, but, but I've got one, <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, I've always laughed, um, and so I do a certain, a bit of, of, uh, goofing around. When we do the Gate of Sweet Nectar, I'll often wear my clown mask. But other times I wear like a very, you know, little Buddha's sitting. So, and it is interesting, right? Because like anything, people will, what I've found is sometimes people will, uh, the idea is to be free. Uh, also, like, so sometimes people will get um, very attracted to the clowning thing, but not quite know how to hold it, you know, when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate. Um, uh, and, and that's a tricky thing because it's, it's almost like a different kind of teaching that would be happening there, right? And, and, and I am, my teacher Murio was a very kind of a old, I don't, old school sort of Zen teacher and and I'm pretty old school in terms of my, my Zen teacher stuff with a sense of humor. Like, I, I still like to laugh, you know. I'll put my shoes on backwards. <laughs> right foot on left foot, you know. Um, and go. But, you know, the thing is, you c if you do it well, you can actually, there's real, like, like if you read Layman Pang, right, the, he has a, this tremendous sense of humor, but he's also really on point. He's 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 teaching, you know. Um, so I appreciate the question, Miocian, and it's something I'm still learning to do, you know. But more and more, I, I have a feeling it's about being comfortable with it, you know. M m less as I said, for me, less with the clowning part of it and more with the, the, the being a Dharma teacher or, or you know, um, that part of it's a little hard. <laughs> is that, does that, is that satisfying? Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I guess what I was saying too, right, is like anything, like yeah, it's where when people get stuck in something, so if you get stuck in clowning and that's your shtick all the time, you know, um, it might, might work, it might not, but it's not about, um, it's about being free, you know, uh, being free in this life and, 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 and responding kindly and appropriately to each of the 10,000 dharmas <laughs> that you're connected to. Thanks, Ingu. Jordan, hi. Hello, thank you. I'm really grateful for your talk, and it's given me a lot to reflect on as far as my own um, my own upbringing in the tradition of my childhood and um, how much humor really played into that. My I'm an, I'm an Episcopalian, and my parents uh, worked within uh, the world of religious studies. 
but they always had a great sense of humor. Like they had a Buddy Price bobblehead, you know, the one giving a thumbs up and, <laughs> and they brought humor into, my dad would change the words of hymns to make it kind of funny for us as kids. And, and I think that that kind of lightening it up helped us to, to be comfortable with that and to then always be curious about it. Because if my dad could change it up, then, well, what, what did it mean really? And it helped us um, in many ways to explore and it gave us permission to not take our, our journey too seriously. Um, if that makes sense. And, and I think that that's a really important spiritual lesson for a lot of people is that there's such um, openness, patience, um, I might use the word like grace that occurs when you're willing to, to be silly <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and to invite others into that silliness as well. Um, because in that sense, then it gives people permission to do that. And um, it made me think of, so I was just recently ordained an Episcopal priest and I was at a clergy gathering and um, we had a karaoke night. And funny enough, Episcopal priests are pretty introverted people, but I'm not. And my husband and I love karaoke. And so I thought this was so much fun. I'm going to have a great time. <laughs> so I went up and I did a song that I love. It's a salt and pepper, you know, 90s rap song. And the best compliment that I got was that because it's a very, you know, like fun and boisterous song, um, I gave people permission to do whatever else after that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because right it's just don't don't because singing boy people take singing really seriously and like, no nope, i can't sing but i can rap so i'll do this <laughs> and i think that permission that it gives um yeah we overlooked that so i appreciate that you were able to touch on that and it invited me to reflect on that too so thank you very yeah. much yeah thank you that's wonderful and and yeah that's that in that connection right you know, it's funny because Greg Boyle, he has this whole chapter about how silly they are sometimes at Homeboys, you know. And these are like gang guys who, you know, pretty spooky, scary. But it's like a human thing to be silly sometimes, to laugh together, you know. It's very human. And, and um, it has so many good lessons, humility, uh you know, um, being one of them. Um, uh, my dad used to say, my dad was a wonderful painter, um, and uh, he used to say, take what you do seriously, but never take yourself seriously. That was one of the only, he wasn't like a big lessons guy, you know, but <laughs> but that was the one thing that he, he used to say to me, and, and I thought that that was a wonderful, um, wonderful thing. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Hoden, hi. Yeah, hi there. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for being here. Yeah, uh, thank you. I um, I was wondering how it works, uh, like for clowning, you open this space for uh, you're giving mothers permission to be silly and opening up a space for kind of being more present. Uh, yeah. How how do you also work with the sadness that you said sometimes you'll encounter someone and you wouldn't necessarily clown with them, but I think of clowning as also opening up space for, you know, sorrow and how clowns can be really sorrow, you know, um, wide range of emotions. How, how do you work with that side? So, you know, it's interesting because this whole thing of wearing a clown mask every day, right, kind of like has put me into that head where, where I get to experience it. But one of the like if I go around and like when this woman said to me, Michelle, you know, uh, Michelle, you know, I lost my baby, you know, I, I stand and cry with her, you know, right. Um, I mean, you know, uh and and it doesn't mean but then there's 500 people at work or 400 or whatever it is and it's this huge number so you know it doesn't mean that um that then i stay there you know um 
I, I go and, and then talk to other people. And, but um, I think that the space isn't necessarily, I think that, that, that creating that space, there's a beautiful saying from um, Sagio, who, which I, uh, who was a, a poet, a, a Zen Buddhist priest and a poet, and he wrote, wherever you go, that's where you need to open your heart, you know? And I, I thought that that was such a wonderful, um, like, I read that right before we went on retreat last year in, in Black Hill or up in Wyoming. And, and it was like, yeah, that's it. You know, wherever you go, that's where, you know, uh, you, the work is to open your heart, you know? Um, and when you open your heart, it's open. It's open to, to joy and it's open to sadness, you know, regardless of the mask that you're wearing, right? Um, and people, because I do that every day, and many of these folks I've worked with for, I've worked at, for 20 years for Tate's, and, and so many of these folks I've known for a long time, you know. Um, I know, I, I, I sometimes know their parents, I, sometimes I know their children. <laughs> Sam, that's not a feather. <laughs> so, so, um, and I think opening your heart is really important and paying attention, you know, really paying attention to, because we're constantly communicating to one another without, without opening our mouths, right? Um, and so learning to um, see you know, um, and feel uh, w w what energy is being invited out. Um, I think that's important too, you know, and, and something that, uh, you know, in the practice of bearing witness, all of those things come up. And the interesting thing is a lot of the times when we'll sit and, in, in, and listen in, in, uh, out west, you know, one of the things that I notice is in the first days, people can't sit with the grief. The grief is almost too hard to sit with. And so anything that I can, like, I'm going to offer you help. And what can I do? I'm going to organize this and take it and make it better. And, and, um, and I always point out to people, you know, um, Lakota people have had like 300 years of white people helping them and it hasn't worked out really that well. So maybe you need to just like calm down, sit and feel that grief, you know, let it, let it, um, let it roll through, you know, let the grief roll through and not necessarily do something about it right away, you know, um, that's a hard, hard thing to do. Um, but I know that also in my own life, like, you know, sometimes my wife will come home and complain about work and I'll be like, okay, let's fix this, you know? <laughs> and she's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't need you to fix this. I just want you to listen to me, you know? Right. So, um, that took a long time to, to stop making to-do lists <laughs> when she came to me with, uh, and just to listen, you know, um, and then to trust that it's not like if I don't offer help right now, that that may not happen in the future, right? Um, it's just that right now is the time for listening. And, and so, yeah, opening your heart, I think is is how you create that space and and how to respond as Bernie said it it arises naturally you know if if this hand is on fire this hand doesn't go like oh what should I do you know do you need help <laughs> it just takes care of it you know it puts the fire out you know recently what my job at, at Tate's is procurement so I buy all the ingredients and packaging and everything and and you've all heard about the supply chain crisis right you know so recently our leadership team came in and they were like we're gonna help you with this supply chain crisis we're gonna solve it together 
and my CEO gives me uh, a template for a spreadsheet, a template where she wants me to list all the ingredients and packaging that we use and how many days of inventory we have. <laughs> I said, by the time I finished filling out your spreadsheet, we use like 800 ingredients and packaging. By the time I finish doing this spreadsheet, the supply chain crisis will be over, you know? <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, that I think sometimes catching the ways that we try to fix things and it's a way sometimes of not actually feeling what's what's happening there. It's a way of not opening our hearts because when we open our hearts, the risk is we're exposed. You know, the risk is that our heart might be broken. Um, yeah. Thanks, Angu. Thank you. This is really rich. I hate to interrupt. Does anyone else have a question you want to? We were going to stop at the top of the hour, but I, I don't want to. <laughs> no, no. You guys need to sit. I've already done all my sitting. <laughs> Anything else? I've got a great question, but we're prob we probably are out of time. Another time, Angu, uh, and, and not just to dangle this and then take it away, but another time, I'd, I'd love to have you talk about Heyoka, because I know that's something you know a lot about. Mm. and how that clown tradition exists in Lakota culture. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and we're coming up on the retreat here soon. So yeah. it's, so it's a bit timely. And, uh, yeah. And I think that clown tradition exists all over the world, you know, throughout culture, but yeah, that's, that's for anthropologists to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Oka is really interesting. Hey, Oka are the, the, the opposite. They do everything backwards, you know, and it's, they're often considered to be very, very powerful medicine people, you know, very, very powerful. It, it, you have to have a dream, a certain type of dream. In fact, um, it's of the thunder beings like Amy's screen thing there. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's a dream. And then that dream has to be interpreted by a, a medicine person. But Black Elk was a Hayoka, you know, um, uh, some of the most, uh, the, 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 the deepest medicine people were Hayoka. And uh, it's a really, yeah, that is a really deep, I would love to talk about it. And it's a living tradition. We met, a, we met a Hayoka um, this past year. And, uh, and it's a little scary, too. <laughs> yeah, 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 I, yeah, I, I was a little, I, I was aware. Of him, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, He, you know, he worked. I asked him, and he was like, "Well, I work with people on the fringes," you know. Yeah. Um, so he, his, his group was like ex-cons, uh, former addicts, those types of people. Uh, a lot of uh, people who are transgender. That's Hayoka, also. Well, uh, Michelle, uh, Ingo, I'm, I'm going to thank you so very much. And please, it, you are invited and welcomed to sit with us until 25 after. At the same time, we know what time it is in New York and understand that. Um, I got to pack my bags. Well, you're, oh, that's right. And your, and your cookie spreadsheet is waiting for you as well. So, <laughs> yeah. so uh, if you need to go, we, we, we sincerely understand and thank you from our hearts uh for sharing uh your uh your wisdom and your clowning and your story <laughs> not in that order though but no. yeah it was really wonderful to meet all of you and, and, and even on this format but um i hope to one day meet all of you face to face in the flesh and uh and yeah you know and invite joy <laughs>